Here, uh, John, when do you guys... You're, uh, of May? Of May, okay. All right. I'll get working on that church for you. Tacoma, Washington. I'll... All right, well, I'll get working. I'll make some calls, as they say in South Philly. I know a guy, so, yeah. All right, we're in uh, Revelation 17 tonight, and we've been steadily working toward this. We've gotten to the point where... The seventh vial has been poured. You're at the end, closing in on the very end of the tribulation period. And God's going to unfold some things. And remember, the Bible is not a uh, the Bible is not a, tr a, a, a tract. It's a comprehensive book that should be taken in its entirety. It, it's not to be limited to one passage or, or a few passages to one. Uh, if you watched our institute last night, if anybody got a chance to watch that, the table of showbread had two rows of six on there, which is 66 loaves from the the divine oven from heaven. So we have 66 books in our Bible and they're all uh, perfectly cohesive in, in, in every, every sense, anthropologically, geologically, geographically, um, astronomically, sociologically, uh, doctrinally. I mean, they're just perfectly cohesive. And so God's going to unfold some things here. Now I'm going to just put out a disclaimer I didn't write Revelation 17. <laughs> God did. And, uh, and he, he's pretty clear on what's going on in the world. As a matter of fact, my wife was talking to a friend. And, uh, you know, what a lot, of, a lot of preachers do is they say, you know, we don't, we're not going to be here. What do we have to study Revelation for? But the, the, the reality of it is that everything that you and I have seen thus far in the 16 chapters of Revelation, they affect us on a daily basis, whether you know it or not. And uh, they're going to, I believe, affect us more and more as time goes on. So we're in Revelation 17. I'll read verse 1 and then we'll pray. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore, that sitteth upon many waters. God had a blessing to the reading, teaching, preaching, explaining, the applying of the Word of God to our hearts and lives tonight. We pray that you'd hedge our building with uh, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray that you would impart unto us a great, uh, a great uh, blessing of illumination that we might be able to see the Word of God as it unfolds before our very eyes as uh, we see how you present it in the light of history, uh, in the light of uh, church history. Pray that you would uh, just help us to receive that which you've prepared for us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. And so this angel takes John and says, come hither, I want you to, I want you to see something. And, you know, it's not a pleasant word, but it's a, a Bible word. He says, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And then he says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. The inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. In 1825, Pope Leo XII struck a medal one side had his image and the other side had the uh, image of a woman with a cup. And on the side with the woman's image, 
The inscription read, Set it super universum, which in English translated from the Latin means the whole world is her seat. The her that he was referring to is this woman of Revelation 17. This woman who God has already called a harlot who's riding this beast. On page 125, in the rise and fall of the Roman Catholic Church, Peterson quotes Pope Pius IX, Pope Pius IX's decree that, and I quote, a man is free to embrace and profess whatever religion he believes to be true is a false teaching. The Roman Catholic Church, brethren, does not believe, and I don't know what your, you guys are visiting, I don't know what your affiliation is, but uh, regardless, I know what my affiliation is, and I served uh, the devil for two years as an altar boy, as a young Roman Catholic, growing up in, in uh, my neighborhood, and I know what it's like to be involved in the Mass and have a hand in it, and I know what it's like to come to Christ and get saved and be born again, and for God to open my eyes, and one of the one of the greatest tragedies we, we have today, in my personal opinion, is that there are people that would label, classify Revelation 17 as hate speech. And that's sad and it's tragic. The Bible is not hate speech. It's truth. And so, when we consider it from the perspective of God, you know, I've had people say to me over the years, you know, Christians have caused more wars and more death than any other religion on the face of the earth. And that's not true. That is not true. I know church history and I, I, I know, and I'm not bragging, I know church history very well. And I can tell you that Bible-believing, born-again Christians have never caused a war. And we don't go out of our way to fight in wars. The, the wars that they're talking about and the bloodshed they're talking about are wars and bloodshed that has come from the very, the very seat of Satan through the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church has had her hand in every war since... A.D. 300, World War I and World War II included. Say, well, I don't know that to be true. Well, then go do some reading and study history, and you'll find out that it's exactly the case. She's had her hand in everything. And so when we consider it from a biblical perspective, we see that in verse 1 that there's a time, the time for the great whore to be judged. There's a who. Well, she's the great whore. Where? This place where it is said that she sits on many waters. Waters are representative of Gentiles and Gentile nations. So this woman reigns over Gentile nations. The identity, verse 2. You'll know this woman because the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The drunkenness of her wine is every false doctrine that exists in the world. You, you must realize that there's so much heresy being circulated and taught today, even on, well, not even on, poor choice of the beginning of a sentence, but you, you look at, um, and, I, and I just heard this today. I, I was listening to somebody just today, and they were exposing false teachers, and they actually had uh, an interview with Joel Osteen, where, you know, he said, you know, listen, 99.9% .9 of people are basically good. And I've been to, this is quoting him, I've been to India and I've seen those people and they're sincere 
and they're honest and they're good and they love God. Yeah, but that's not what the Bible says. As a matter of fact, it's exactly opposite of what the Bible says. 99.9% .9 of men are not good. We are inherently evil and wicked and sinners. And so what happens is that kind of stuff gets circulated. And people slowly begin to believe it. And so when you expose what the, when you teach what the Bible already exposes, people think, well, isn't that guy just a hater? No, I'm not a hater. I, I can tell you from experience, my wife, my children, and I, we've knocked on more doors in Philadelphia of people that were of Roman Catholic faith than most people you'll ever meet in your life. Don't tell me I don't love them. I love those people. I don't love the system they're a part of. But I love the people because I identify with them. I was one. I understand it. I know what these people are indoctrinated with. I understand the superstitions they're raised with. I understand the lies and the deceit that they are taught from when they're just little kids. And they believe me. They, they believe exactly what that Pope said. The idea that men are free to believe and embrace what they believe to be true is a false teaching. If you want to get down to the nitty gritty, that colonization was not just about the extracting of raw materials from people. It was about, it was about bringing a crown and a seat of Rome to these people that did not yet have an opportunity to be under the thumb of the popes and the church. And uh, again, I'm not going to teach you a, a course on world history. I mean, I will if the Lord tells me to, but I'm certainly not going to do it tonight. And so the identity, well, you'll know her because she has a good relationship with all the kings of the earth. She's committed fornication. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman. And again, it's a woman he sees. He sees this woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. You know, the Bible's full of types. And uh, these colors that he's going to present here are the colors of the Roman church. Scarlet and purple and gold. And so, it says, upon the scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten hordes. What are these names of blasphemy? Well, I know people that say, yeah, I, I, I respect what you people teach about Jesus, but I've got St. Anthony. I've got St. Augustine. I've got St. Jude. I'm trusting my saint to get me to heaven. I'm trusting the Blessed Virgin to get me to heaven. Say, what happens when somebody trusts the fact that they have an image that they can hold in their hand or an image that they can see and pray to? Listen, folks, I'm telling you, I was a part of it for 17 years of my life, I remember walking into the Catholic Church and kneeling down in front of the statues, kneeling down in front of the Blessed Mother and, and you know, saying my prayers and asking for miracles. Let me tell you something. There is no such thing as an unsaved person that is a saint or can do miracles. The Bible clearly teaches that there are two powers in this universe. There's the power of God, and then there's the power of Satan. In exposing false teachers, how many of you ever heard of Kenneth Copeland? Anybody hear of Kenneth Copeland? Kenneth Copeland said that what a surprise it was when he realized the greatest failure in the Bible was God. Woo! You talk about blasphemy... He lost the earth, he lost the garden, he lost man, he, lo he lost Lucifer. 
And then he goes and indicts God. And yet there are people say, well, I never knew that. And I think, do you ever read your Bible? Do you ever actually take out your Bible and read it? And the fact is, most people do not. And so we see this woman riding this beast. The beast is full of names of blasphemy. Having seven heads, and God will tell us who those heads are in a moment, and ten horns, and he'll tell us who the horns are as well. And the woman was arrayed. And if I'll, I'll just tell you ahead of time that this woman is a bride, a body, and she's a city. Because if you remember, we've been talking about the great counterfeit, Antichrist. And if you, you don't have to go there now, but in Ephesians 5, when you understand, when the Bible talks about a man loving his wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, and then Paul says, this is a mystery. Well, you're going to find out that one of the names used, one of the the uh, words used, the descriptions, is mystery. This is mystery Babylon. In other words, there's something going on with this woman riding this beast that is as much a mystery as it was to a Christian concerning his relationship to Christ and the church. Everybody follow me there? And so you're going to see how God reveals it. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup. That's the chalice. What people don't realize, and boy, I, I, I'm getting memory rushes. I remember, you know, the priest walking over to the two altar boys, and one of us had the the water, and the other one had the wine and the little cruets, and he would come over with the cup, and uh, he would say, they were always real heavy on the wine and real light on the water, if that tells you something. And, uh, boy, I, I can't tell you how many times, and, and you had to beat, man, you had to have your two fingers and your thumb just right, and you had to pour it, and as soon as he put a little pressure, that meant enough, and, I mean, there were times we got reamed out in the sanctuary, in the back of the sanctuary, after the Mass was over, because he just didn't like the way things went, or he just was having a bad day. And so we see the golden cup, the chalice. That's what it's referring to. Just know this, and, and, I, know, and I know that people are not Bible astute. And people say, hey, when's your Mass? Just like... Full disclosure, we don't have a Mass, okay? The word Mass entails a blood sacrifice. We're not killing any chickens or roosters or rabbits here. First of all, Terry would never come if we were, because she's an animal lover. She hates when I say, shoot the dog! She gets really upset when I say that. That's a joke, I'm only joking. But in the, in the occult, Satanists, Luciferians, observe and celebrate black masses. You ever hear of a black mass? Well, that means that something is being slain, blood is being spilt, whether it's animal or human. You say, that's crazy. I admit it's crazy, but it happens and it's true. You ever talk to a state trooper, you talk to people, you talk to people in the FBI, and they'll give you story after story of things they find, remains they find. And it is clear that some kind of occult practice or worship or santeria. Anybody know what santeria is? <laughs> that stuff goes on more than you think, more than you know. And so, whenever you hear mass, you must understand it implies a, a, the death of a corpse, 
say, what do you mean? Well, when the priest holds the wafer and he says what? Corpus Christi, body of Christ, right? That's what he's saying. This is Christ's body. Do you believe it is the literal body of Christ? If so, respond by saying, Amen. It's not figurative, it's literal. And the blood that you drink, when you drink of the chalice, that's not figurative, it's to be accepted as literal. This is the literal blood of Jesus Christ. That is why they are able to call it a mass. Because they believe that there's a literal slaying of a body every time a mass is celebrated. And it's uh, quite startling, quite eye-opening, when you consider what the, the Roman church actually teaches. And I could tell I'm not going to get too far in this study tonight. But, um, so we see the golden cup. There's no mistaking who this is. The golden cup is the chalice. And upon her forehead was a name written. There it is. Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And so this, this woman is the mother of harlots. And she's got some whorish children. Now I'm really going to some friends. <laughs> My son smirks like there he goes again. If Rome is the mother of harlots, then get the Lutheran church, the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, the Episcopalian church. Guess what they are? They're the children of harlots. That's why in the day in we live, they're all going back and to the roost from where they came. Now, I have Presbyterians that say you can't talk like that. Listen, I just, I just told you, I was an idolater serving Satan on in a mass for two years. If I can come clean with what I am and what I was involved in, uh, in before I met Christ, why can't you? Why can't you just accept it? You were bamboozled, you were wrong, you got truth, you got saved, if you are in fact saved, and... He is the way, the truth, and the life, and everything else is a lie. What's so hard about that? I don't get it. Than a person's pride or family legacy. And so it says mystery. There's a mystery here. The mystery is that people have not recognized her for who and what she is. Thank God he reveals it. Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. This is not just something that's happening in the Vatican, brethren. These are things that are happening all around the globe. Her influence knows no boundaries. And I saw the woman. Well, now he really hits the nail on the head. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. I don't know. You want to put a number on it? J.M. Carroll, his conservative number is 50 million Bible-believing Christians have been martyred under the, under the iron fist of Rome. I personally think it's considerably more than 100 million. That's my personal opinion. From what I understand and know and have read about history, I think it's well over 100 million people have died under the iron hand of the iron fist of Rome. When you go and consider what history teaches us about the Inquisition, and just so you know, and there's a reason why I mention Inquisition. What happened in the Inquisition? They, they made a particular device. Anybody know what it was? The rack, and what was the other thing? The guillotine. <laughs> what happened when you put your head in a guillotine? Shoop. Does not the Bible say that there are those that will be beheaded in the tribulation period? I got news for you. The guillotine's going to make a comeback. And if you can't get them to the guillotine, 
they'll just take your head off with a sword. Now you remember those videos that we saw when they would capture people from the West and they would kneel them down and they would get a, a, a sword and chop their heads off? That practice is alive and well today. Maybe not a team, but with a sword for sure. You say, why are you such a literalist? Because it's a literal book. That's why. And the woman's drunken with the blood of the saints. This woman could care less about a human soul. She cares less about it. It's all about her power, her wealth, her control, and her influence. Now, if I were to take a left turn, and I'm not, if I were going to take a left turn, I would tell you how much involvement the Roman church, through the Jesuit priesthood, and through uh, Roman Catholic influence universities have influenced the whole of academia. That's why your Bible, your King James Bible, is under such attack, even in Bible colleges. You can go to a Christian university, and you tell them you're a Bi King James using Christian, and they'll go, oh, okay. Like, there's something wrong with you. Like, you, you have some kind of a disease or something. Like, you actually believe that book? And again, I'm not going to turn left here. I'll stick with, the, stick with the script. And she's drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When, and this is not, I want you to know, this is not limiting this to the tribulation period, although it will increase exponentially in the tribulation period. It's not limited to the tribulation period. This is the mystery that God wants you to see through the mother of harlots. You know, when I was a young kid and I went to Catholic school, they made sure that we understood that the Roman Catholic Church was the mother of all churches. I remember sitting in a Catholic uh, a religion class and somebody saying, you know, my grandmom goes to a different church. Or my, and, and if they were a Protestant church, the nun or whoever was teaching the class would say, well, you know, but our church is the mother of all churches. Why do you think God uses that word, the mother of harlots there? Because they claim to be the mother of all churches. It says, and the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? Why are you so surprised? What's so surprising about this? Have you ever read the newspaper? <laughs> Have you ever picked up a history book? Have you ever picked up a Bible and read it? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. In my Bible, just so you know, I have a heading that says the Roman Empire revived. When I was a young Christian growing up, and I learned Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation, I was told that of the, of the, the Colossus in Daniel 2, that the legs and toes represented the revived Roman Empire. That is not true. We're not talking about a revived Roman Empire here. We're talking about a satanically influenced, satanically led government with Antichrist as its head. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a revived Roman Empire. That is not biblically true. The beast that thou sawest was. So whoever this beast is, it was. That's number one. And then look at it. Is not. Is not. And shall ascend. Out of where? Ah, the bottomless pit. We already covered this in Revelation 13. I'm not going to go back and reteach it. But was, so they lived, this person lived on the earth at one time. Right now they are not. And in the tribulation period, 
They're going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. Well, I'm not going to reteach it, but if you remember, we said it is none other than Judas Iscariot. What is he? He is a Hamitic, referring to dark skin, Semite, meaning Jew, having European descent. That's who this person's going to be. And he ascends the bottomless pit. And if you don't know where we got that and you guys first time here, why would you know that unless you studied this? This is taken from the leopard of Revelation 13. That leopard is tan with a white belly and black spots. So this person has the, the bloodline of Shem, Ham, and Japheth as, the, as they've come off the ark. It says, was not, shall, shall ascend, future, out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Now, brethren, I got to tell you, there's only two people in your Bible that are known by the word perdition. One is Judas, and the other is Antichrist. You say, is that a biblical clue that they are one and the same person? I believe it is. Pastor, I don't agree with you. Don't agree. I don't care. You don't have to agree, but I think I, we've already shown enough Bible to uh, weigh that point down. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Whoa. It says, is not and yet is. So whoever this being that shall ascend right now is on the earth. Through what? Well, through the presence and power of Satan. Remember we said that the king of the bottomless pit is the king of a place called Abaddon. He has both human and angelic blood. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the Roman sitteth. You go and check a city. There is only one city in all the world that is known as the city on seven hills or mountains. And that is the Vatican in Rome. So, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Here's where you have to actually take your time and read the text. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. Now let me explain something. In Revelation 13, we talked about... Um, we talked about Babel, or Babylon. Then we talked about Egypt. Then we talked about Assyria. Then we talked about Babylon. Uh, then we talked about um, the Persian Empire, right? Then we talked about the Grecian Empire. And then we talked about the Roman Empire. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He says there are five kings. Now watch this. Everybody see this? This and this are one and the same kingdom. John is giving this under the rule of Domitian in Rome. So it's clearly not Rome that he's talking about when it talks about one is. When you look at these... This is what it boils down to. Babylon, Egypt, Assyria, Greece. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed Persia in there. Persia. 
Now watch this. They're the five that he's talking about. They're the five. If you remember, in the book of Daniel, out of the goat came who? Anybody remember that? Out of the goat came the little horn. Did you guys ever study Daniel? Is this all Greek to you? Sorry if it is. I apologize. Out of the, out of the goat came the little horn. And so when we read that again, watch this. And there are seven kings, five are fallen. So that means there are seven kingdoms that are gone. Right? And then it says, watch this, and one is. Well, who's that? Well, that's Rome. But let me ask you something. Is Italy ruling the world right now? No, it's not Italy. But it's something in Rome. Anybody have a guess? <laughs> it's the Vatican. It's the, it's the mystery Babylon, right? Now watch this. One is, and the other is not yet come. So the seventh, one, two, three, four, five, six, the seventh, uh, six, seventh, is not yet come. He's yet to come. So, world dynasty, world dynasty, world dynasty, world dynasty, world dynasty. This is still a world dynasty, but not politically. It's religious, although her religion influence and affects all the governments of the world. The, Vatican's, the Vatican is directly involved in what goes on in the UN. And I'm not going to go turn left on that either, but you need to start reading what I tell you to read. And learning and researching. And so this one, the seventh, is yet to come. Whoever this person is, they are going to dominate the world. Just like Pharaoh did. Just like Cyrus did just like Nebuchadnezzar did, just like Sennacherib did, just like Caesar did. This is going to be a dominant person to be reckoned with in the period. And it says, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, now what's it say? He is there any doubt that the masculine pronoun refers to a man? He must continue a short space. Well, what is the short space? I can tell you what the short space is. The short space, you got to remember, and I'll finish with this point and we'll get to prayer. Right now we're in the church period. Right? It's been, just say, 2,000 years. At some point, the rapture happens, you got seven year tribulation period. It's broken up into two halves three and a half, three and a half. We've already learned that whoever this guy is, he's going to be on the seat of the Vatican. And have dominant power. But in the middle of the week, according to Daniel chapter 9, he's going to sit on the throne of God claiming that he is who? God. That's the abomination of desolation. This guy's going to claim to be the Christ, the anointed of God. And he's going to reign not just from Jerusalem, but he's going to reign over the whole world. I mean, we're talking about a global reign here for a short space or three and a half years. Now watch. And the beast that was and is not, and even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. So let me ask you something. 
when liberal Bible expositors say, well, clearly, in the tribulation period, the ten kings are a ten European federation. Remember when they came together and they made the euro and they said, that's it, that's it, we're in the end times. Look up, look up. Then you hear about Brexit, right? These ten kings have not even begun to reign yet. These are not regular flesh and blood men that are going to rule these ten nations. As a matter of fact, we'll read two passages and then we'll get to prayer. It says in the ten horns, a horn is authority or power or anointing in the scripture. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, one spirit, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. For what purpose? Look at verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Now, I'm going to go back to Daniel chapter 2, when it talks about the ten toes of the Colossus, and it says this, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. Everybody says, Rome, Rome, Rome. Not so fast. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, Rome, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Well, miry clay in the Bible stands for flesh, humanity. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of the clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So whoever these ten kings that are going to rise the power in the second half of the tribulation, they're going to be neither iron or clay. They're going to be a mix. They're going to be a hybrid. And just like one does not cleave to the other, they're going to have a dual genetic pool, if that makes sense. Say, Pastor, who do you think it is? Well, I've already touched on this. This is one of the most difficult classes to sit in when you first visit a church. But we've already discussed that there are stars that John sees fall from heaven to earth. And we said those stars are angelic creatures. And just like there are, there is unity and a hierarchical system in the heavenlies. And just like God has his archangels, like Gabriel and Michael and so on. I personally believe that these ten kings will be angels that somehow are given a form of human flesh. And I, my default position is, look to Hollywood. Remember the movie Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger? You remember what happened in that movie? What happened? 
The artificial intelligence became so smart, they were able to clone themselves in flesh, and it was undistinguishable. Whoever these ten kings are, the world is going to see them as mere men, but they're going to be something much greater than that. They're going to actually be demons, fallen angels, that are taking on some kind of a human body, some kind of fleshly manifestation. And they're going to rule and reign with him for one hour, and they're going to give all of their power, all of their influence to him. Antichrist. This is not a good time to not believe the Bible when that happens. This is going to be difficult living on the earth. Say, Pastor, you think we're moving toward that? Yeah, absolutely. You go and, you go and read some of the things that Elon Musk is warning the world about artificial intelligence. And let me tell you, there are some people that are very, very intelligent, and they understand the dangers of AI in this world. And they're coming out and telling you, you better be careful. There are, there are some wicked people, wicked corporations that are spending a whole lot of time and money trying to produce something the world has never seen. And so when you talk about the liberal, progressive mind, do you know what? There are, there are people so delusional of history that they believe that all the world needs is some perfect man to come and cure all the ills of the earth. Some Christians even believe that. And listen, I, I'm a, I, I, a fan of, of Mr. Trump, but I never for one second was delusional thinking he was the answer to America's problems. You need to realize something. There is no man other than the man Christ Jesus that is going to rectify this thing. But the world is being slowly and slowly led to the idea that some superman is going to one day come and save the world of all of its problems. And that's where all of the literature, and that's where all of the entertainment, and that's where everything is moving toward. And that's why these ten toes, if you will, of Daniel, are going to come on the scene. And they are going to have tremendous influence and power and dominion, and they're going to bring all of that right back to Antichrist. That's just part of Revelation 17. We'll pick up the rest next week. God bless our prayer time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.